Welcome into Rounding the Bases Live, presented by Enterprise Bank and Trust. My name is Joel Goldberg. Take two for those of you that were trying to watch live. I think we have what I call the computer gremlins all worked out, fingers crossed. It happens in this day and age that we live in with Zoom calls, and you hope that it's not anything really major. And every now and then it does. Uh, that's the first time it's really happened like that on my end, the good old reboot. It was already the second one in the morning. But I think we're back in business, which is good, because we didn't miss any of the conversation. I just couldn't get it to my guest, and now I have the ability to do that. Uh, as always, a big thanks to my sponsor, Enterprise Bank and Trust, hashtag no stopping you. That is a hashtag that I know would apply to my guest. And really one of the things that I love about this podcast is highlighting success stories, adversity, and that today is just one of the many topics that I can cover with my guest who has an amazing story and really one that in many ways for him is just beginning or at least a new chapter going on in his life. So it is my pleasure right now to bring in to Rounding the Bases, Devin Hedgepeth. Devin, how are you? I'm good, Joe. How are you? Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And, you know, I'll let in a little, it's not really a secret, but you and I had been introduced by a past guest of Rounding the Bases, Parker Graham, who was a college football teammate of right. yours. I didn't know that offensive linemen and defensive backs could hang out <laughs> together. Only uh, sometimes. A, <laughs> only sometimes. Doesn't happen much. He's a, a you know an entrepreneur, a businessman. You are the same. And there's so much in your story that I want to talk about that I think everyone can learn from. I say it so often. There's so many lessons learned in sports. First and foremost, congratulations on the next endeavor in your life. You. Not just any business school, perhaps the best business school in the United States, Stanford School of Business. How does that sound? Sounds great. I appreciate it. It was a, a long journey to get there, and I'm definitely blessed to say that I got accepted. I got in, so I'm excited for it. Well, it's, it's pretty amazing and really just a part, I believe, of your journey. And what I love about the thoughts of this interview is how many different areas that we can cover regarding business, mm -hmm. regarding life, regarding adversity, regarding diversity. But I'll, I'll back up. I mentioned Parker. He and I um, got to know each other from my podcast, and then he connected us. He thought it would be a good connection, and you and I were set – Work, you're working down in Houston or were at, at ExxonMobil. Yeah. So I thought, all right, Royals, Astros, let's do a podcast down there yeah. before this video thing um, had started. And that obviously never happened with COVID. So better late than never. Let's start with this. Your background in football. And I know all kids that love sports have dreams of playing in baseball or football or basketball or hockey or soccer, or whatever it is. How big were your NFL dreams, and how legitimate were they? They were big. Um, you know what's funny is, and I'll, I'll take it back to when I first started to play football. I actually hated football when I first started. Mm. Um, I believe I started around the third grade. And like most kids, you start by either, you know, you having a, a, a huge desire to play the sport or your dad probably kind of pushed you to play and, and so I was the latter and my dad really encouraged me to, to get into the sport and I think at that time a lot for him was just wanting me to get into some kind of um, sport so that I could build that discipline so that he could further mm -hmm. teach me about attitude and, and perseverance and discipline and football was the the perfect sport for me but I didn't realize it and, and I just hated it at first um, I hated going outside of the practices. I hated the, the heat, diving into the grass, getting all itchy, the long practices and, and having to do it the next day. But lo and behold, I was actually decently good at it. And I got better every year. And it wasn't until high school that I really started to, to learn how to love the sport of football. And then in college, I, I truly fell in love with it. And I think to answer your question, um, you know, I always use the the story, the example of I, I can vividly remember sitting in my dorm, my college dorm, and I Googled myself and I saw at the end of my freshman season, had a phenomenal freshman season, was able to start because a senior in front of me got injured, stepped into a starting role, um, filled that role pretty well. And I remember Googling myself and 
I was already projected in the 2014 NFL draft. And for me, that was that became reality, right? Before then, I, I had the desire, I, but it was just a wish. But to see my name on that list, knowing that I had already accomplished what I accomplished as a true freshman in the Big 12, by the way, as a defensive back, that really solidified it for me that, okay, this is more than just a dream. It's now a reality. What steps do I need to take to, to you know, accomplish that reality, take care of business, and then at the end of my senior year, hopefully get drafted in a good position? So I was definitely looking forward to it. Well, you were on that track, and to be starting at Oklahoma State was where Devin played college football and, and starting as a freshman, as a, as a DB, and then, as you mentioned, uh, seeing yourself already being projected. We can throw up the little spoiler alert if I put up Devin's website, <laughs> and what you will see is maybe as you read that first word, Achilles, it, it actually should say, Achilles three with, yeah. the, with, the, with the injuries. I mean, I just, I was telling you before we went on, I, I've always felt like that Achilles rupture has to be one of the worst because it looks so simple, but the pain that you'll see in a guy when he goes down in all sports just looks like something no one in the world would ever want to go through. Not that anybody wants any of these injuries. Mm -hmm. So take me through what happened and, and how your life and those dreams changed. Yeah. The first rupture came against Texas A&M my sophomore year. I believe it was my fourth game in. And the pain had started much, much before then. Uh, around the summertime when we were training for the upcoming season, I had a very sharp pain in my Achilles. And we thought it was just tendonitis, but it didn't go away. I just tried to push through it. And lo and behold, we got to A&M. It was in the fourth quarter, I think, and that was a crazy game. We went into halftime, I think, down 21 or 24 points. We clawed our way back. We were up in the fourth quarter. It was intense. It was heated. And I was, I was manned up. So our defensive strategy that game was any third down or greater where we knew they were going to have to pass the ball, I would line up against Ryan Swope. I don't know if you remember uh, Swope from A&M, but he was a little slot receiver, um, a very Wes Welker type. And he was very elusive. So I was manned up against him. And um, I, I was manned up guarding him. And Markel Martin, the safety, kind of came over top. We jumped up, deflected the ball. I came down. And I stood up. Adrenaline's all in my body, right? So I don't really realize at the time. But my, my leg won't move. It's just laying there limp. My foot is. And I was, I was able to hobble off to the sideline. Um, I was able to get to the sideline. They laid me on the table and they told me I ruptured my Achilles. And there's actually a few different types of Achilles ruptures. Mine was not a full separation the first two times. I had a partial separation about seven eighths of the tendon. So that happened the first time. I did it again. So I rehabbed, went through the cast, the crutches, got into my boot and then did it again uh, during that, that transition, that phase. Came back, rehab, boot, crutches, got to my junior year. And in the third game at home, I went down for the third time. And that third time was a full tear off of the bone. And that one was excru excruciating, um, very painful. So it was difficult. The Just the, the process of getting injured. And I don't think a lot of people realize from a mental standpoint, mm -hmm. physically, it's tough already, right? You're, in a, you're on crutches. You're in a cast. You're in a walking boot. But mentally, it's playing with you. You're not able – you go from, you know, peak performance, being able to do what less than 1% of the world can do to, mm -hmm. you know, you can't even walk to class. You know, I, I need a parking pass. to. to I got to crutch down in my car, drive to class, um, have a parking pass, crutch into the building. And so mentally, it's just very difficult. Um, and it was a tough time for me. But thankfully, I was able to, to get through. I had plenty of people that were surrounding me. Uh, plenty of love, plenty of support, and, and I'm grateful for that. Well, it's the interesting part of this story, and I know you know this so well, athletes can so often be labeled as just athletes. I think the mm -hmm. old term from back in the day, maybe it's still the same, I don't know, is dumb jocks, which I never really yeah. understood. But I get where the stereotype came from. There are a lot of guys that go to go to college on scholarships or in high school or whatever it is, and they don't have interest in the books or they're not good students. That wasn't you. That was clearly from everything that I've read, everything that I've heard. 
you were a guy from the beginning, the way I understood it, straight A's in in high school, maybe top of the class, I think, if I if I saw that. But yep. if football never happened for you, I'm, I'm very convinced with the little that I know about you that you would have been very successful in life. I think that there are, and I'm sure you would agree, plenty of lessons that you pulled from football in terms of discipline and work ethic and all of that that you added on to, I'm sure, what your parents had already taught you. But to have that, Maybe it wasn't a backup plan at the time, but it's amazing because you always hear athletes being told, make sure that you have that backup plan right. because every athlete at some point will be an ex-athlete. Yours just came a lot quicker. What was the mental challenge of making that pivot, I'm sure much quicker than you ever envisioned doing it and just getting focused on the classroom where you were already excelling? The toughest part of the mental challenge was identity. You mm -hmm. go, your most athletes go their entire lives identifying as an athlete. You know, when someone asks me, you know, what do you do? If, if I were a freshman in college and someone asked me, what do you do? I don't say I'm, you know, studying engineering. I say I'm a football player. And by the way, I, you know, do all these other mm -hmm. things because we are more than athletes. But at the end of the day, a large part of who you are is is your craft, being an athlete, because you dedicate so much time into it. To be able to do what you do at that level, you have to sacrifice a ridiculous amount of time. You're waking up at 4.30 a.m., you're hitting the weights, you're going to class, you're coming back for the film session, the, the workouts, the practice afterwards, and you wake up, recycle, and repeat. And so you are then entrenched in this identity that that is a part of who you are. And so when that's taken from you, specifically through an injury, right, because it's so sudden, it's very difficult to just all of a sudden do a 180 pivot and say, this is no longer a part of me. And so the, the hardest part from a mental perspective is being able to re-identify who you are. And I think a, a lot of athletes struggle with that because they, they never get to the point to realize that it's actually not re-identifying who you are. It's just leaning in more to who you already are in, in other aspects, right? So in college, I was an athlete. I was an engineering major, but I was also a son. I was a brother. I was a friend. I was a mentor. I was all of these different things. I was a teacher. I was a learner. That then I just have to repivot my focus, and then I lean into being more of a learner, more of a teacher, a mentor. I now have more time to spread love to help others along their journey. I can tell my story because I know others are out there struggling and hurting. So that was the biggest hurdle for me um, in terms of the mental aspect was just, just having to re-identify myself. Well, you've done that uh, throughout the course of this journey. I, before we talk about so many of the different elements, uh, you've written a lot of a, a right. lot of nice, whether it be essays or articles, and uh, I want to talk about growing up in Derby, Kansas, and your perspective on what's going on in the world. But let's talk about these last five or, or so years. And so you were, but in school, even to back up before that, engineering was your was your classroom passion. Is that accurate? It was industrial engineering was my major, and then I minored in marketing too because I I knew I wanted to be on the business side. I love the business side. I thought I could get through school before I got a taste of it, but um, I fell in love with marketing when I took one class, so I picked up that that marketing minor as well. Did I read something at some point? And if I'm making this up, you can you know you can call BS on me. But did I read that that the interest in engineering happened after a visit to the barber shop or something? Like yeah, that? yeah. I'm surprised you uh you know that. So joseph randall that that name will ring a bell to a lot of oklahoma state fans but joseph randall was uh the starting running back at oklahoma state for a while he went to the dallas cowboys but he and i are from the same area he he grew up in wichita kansas i was in derby kansas which is 10 minutes south so basically the same area and he has an older brother that was a great athlete as well but he he got his engineering degree and he was based there in wichita and so at the end of high school, I was always a, a very um, academic driven person. And I, I, like I said, I loved business, but I also loved engineering. I love the way that engineers think, their thought process, how they approach problems. It's really about problem solving. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted the engineering degree, but I also loved business. So I was torn. So I, I sat down in the barbershop and by chance he was there. I had a 20, 30 minute conversation 
with him waiting on the barber. And he basically explained to me this concept called industrial engineering, which is one of the only engineering principles that take into account the human element. And it has very direct ties to the business world, processes and people. And so I went back, I researched it a little bit more and lo and behold, it was the, the right choice for me. So that is where I first uh, learned about it in the barbershop. It's amazing how those little things can happen. I mean, maybe you do go down this whole path, but maybe not. I mean, if you thought right. about that, if you don't bump in to and, and have that conversation that, that maybe engineering is not, or maybe you would have found it at some point. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's a good broader topic. I think life is a lot about chance encounters, but mm. I don't think we're as lucky as people would assume. I think there's a lot of things in life that, you do that always prepare you for certain moments, right? And this gets in, into the, the whole, the topic that we can, I can talk about hours for, and that's habits. The habits that people form create who they are in life. And so if I have a habit of studying and preparing and always thinking about the future for myself and thinking about what I wanna be, I could have sat down next to, to um, Joseph's brother and had a conversation, but if that was never on my mind, maybe that topic never comes up or maybe it does come up, but I don't necessarily listen. But because I had formed that habit of um, being studious in the classroom, thinking about what I wanted my future to look like outside of football, I sat down, the resource was there, we sparked a conversation and then I pulled something from that resource. And so I think there is an element of luck, but I also think there's a huge element of preparation and, and that can transcend to any conversation in life, whether that's starting your own business, having a healthy relationship, um, getting into the, the school you want, uh, getting good grades. Uh, life for me is a lot about habits. I wanted to ask you about that because I need more of your habits in terms <laughs> of routine. I, I, look, I'll, I'll work as hard as anybody. That's always been the case. I, I was taught well. I was raised well. I, I wish some of that would translate into. I've gone, I've, I've, I've gone and, and gone out and on a run the last two days, which is somewhat record setting. Two there days in a row in, in the ninety <laughs> plus degree heat. What time this morning were you up working out? Uh, I was at four thirty this morning. I actually skipped my workout. Well, not skipped. I did not work out this morning because I'm doing this um, online class before I get into school. I just want to learn a little bit more. So I chose to go the the learning route instead of working out. But I was up at four thirty though. A mental workout. I I <laughs> if I had to predict, I would have guessed the workout was in. But if you had said to me, "Yeah, I woke up at seven thirty, I would have been like, "No chance." There's no, no way <laughs> right, yeah. that this guy is. But you're—I mean, you—you you are very routine based, from what I've learned about you. Very disciplined. Tell me about those personal habits and and how they have shaped you. I mean, they are who I am today. The personal habits that I've created, but more so, I I, it, I think it's important to talk about where they came from, and that's my dad. When I was. Um, young, he really instilled in me, regardless of what I did, whether that was in the classroom, on the field, on the court, wherever it may be, the importance of habits and discipline and perseverance. And the number one thing he instilled in me was um, attitude. He taught me that there's so many different things that can happen in life. There's so many different things that you can't control, you cannot affect, but those are external. But focus on what's internal and what do you have the ability to um, control? And really that boils down to your attitude and it's how you respond to a situation, right? It's, it's how you um, can figure out how to leave your mark on the situation. And that translates into daily habits for me. And I'm all about sustainability and consistency because it, it's, it's sexy in the media to talk about, you know, someone who made that $100 million acquisition, or they did all these things that look really cool, you know, the actors or the athletes that are on TV. But behind all of that, typically are hundreds of thousands of hours, day in and day out, somebody mastering their craft. And those are the things that are not always shown in the media. And, and to do that, you have to be consistent. And you have to be have a sustainable schedule, right? So when I talk about getting up at 4.30, you know, when I first tell that to people, they freak out like, oh, my God, how are you able to do that? And there's a lot of people that do it, right? I'm not necessarily on a pedestal. Sure. But you don't just, 
I mean, I guess you can, but you don't all of a sudden just go from waking up at 11 a.m. one day to I'm going to now wake up at 4.30. How can you get there in a sustainable way where you can be consistent? So maybe you wake up at 10 the next week and maybe 9 the next week and maybe 8 the next week, right? And then once you hit that 4.30 or 5 o'clock routine, how can you slowly start to build in good habits? So I'll wake up and do a 30-minute workout. Right. And then the next month turn it into 45 and an hour after that. And then after that, I start to throw in maybe some online classes or things like that. So it, it's the habits are all about um, being sustainable and being consistent for me, because that's how you you build up to stack to it. But my dad definitely instilled in me the the power of attitude and letting me know that the way you respond to a situation is going to define what you you become in life. And that's really the message I've been trying to spread, whether it's AchillesHealed18.com, the, the TED-like talk that I've given, the short ebook that I've written, um, the different blog posts, any kind of uh, discussion I have with the school or an organization. It, it's, it's all about being resilient. And that ties back to, being, to your attitude, right? When, when an obstacle pops up, to me, resilience is more than just learning how to overcome that obstacle. It's all about learning how to leverage that obstacle to make yourself better. So the very thing that was meant to keep you down is now the reason why you're going to excel in life. The very bullet that was meant to take you out is now the reason why you're going to um, get to the next level and take that next step. It's all about learning how to change your perspective. But in order to do that, you have to ha be, have control of your attitude. You have to be able to say, this external thing that happened to me is not happening to me, it's happening for me. And I have the control to decide how I respond to that, that element. So um, that, that's what it's all about for me. Well, I mean, it, those are amazing lessons. And obviously the influence that your dad has had, and you've written about him a lot. Of, I've, I've read a lot of your work and your posts. I wanna share this, and this is from your, your LinkedIn. But, but they're the three things, control, the things that you can control. We mm -hmm. hear that all the time in sports, control the controllable, strive yep. to be your best self and treat people right. But then also in here you write, in today's media, black men can be inconsistently portrayed, but my dad has been there for me every second of my life and raised me to be the man that I am today. Yep. He instilled an invaluable mindset in me that I'll take to the grave. I love this article because it shows how my dad, who represents so many other black men, set an example to raise a true leader love you dad and so this was uh kansas.com and i would encourage everybody to to certainly check that one out but devin there's there's so much even right here because among your many writings you wrote this letter to your hometown of derby kansas and you know stereotypically in my head i would think wow there you know there was a an african-american kid that came out of this small town he must have just dealt with so much racism. And it was really interesting for me to read it because your perspective, and, and you fill in the blanks, obviously, and if I'm getting it wrong, please let me know. Your perspective was, I had a lot of love in the community, and I love the community of Derby, but we also have work to do. So instead of just attack, attack, it's almost like what we've heard with what needs to be happening in communities, especially minority communities, where there's a lack of trust with the police and we're hearing, look, we got to do a better job to, to, to be a community and understand each other. And it sounds like you already had a lot of that understanding and trust with your community. So it almost enables you to ask them to take that next step. Right. Um, how, how close am I on that? I think you're spot on. Um, you know, when, when the video of George Floyd first came out, there were plenty of instances where um, we had seen things like that, but that video with George Floyd was just a little bit different, right? But I think what people also don't realize is that things like that happen every single day. And there's been so much tension and so much divisive language in, in our country for um, a while now that it was just really disheartening to see that that video somewhat created divide but it was also very um encouraging to see that video bring a lot of people together and you you ask or you talk about my position in derby and potentially what i had to 
um, add to the community in terms of value. And you're spot on. I was in a situation where I, I, I'm known in the community of Derby. I'm very well loved, very well received, not only because of my accomplishments, but just because I'm, I am a member of that community that um, a lot of people know because it is a smaller town. And so when those things happened, I saw not only an opportunity, and, and I hate to use the word obligation because I don't necessarily think that um, black people are obligated to uh, do certain things, but I did see an opportunity to speak up because of my uh, very specific situation. And so I wrote the letter and it was very uh, well received by the community. But like you said, I didn't, I didn't necessarily wanna take a position of, you know, this is what people have to do. This is what they need to do. Because for me, that, that starts to draw on that anxiety and divisive language. For me, I really just wanted to focus on the concept of love, right? You guys know me, you know who I am. Since I was a little kid, you've watched me run around on the football field. You've seen me in the classroom. You've seen me in the, at the jazz concerts. You've, you've helped my family out when my mom got cancer. You know, we were there for you when you all had struggles and concerns. But at the end, and you showed me so much love and, and I wanted to make sure to hammer that point home. But I also wanted to let them know at the end of the day that even in our loving community of Derby, these things still exist. Whether it's on a very large scale or a very small scale, we still have an opportunity to get better and I want us to get better together. So how, how are we able to do that? And that's really the message that I was trying to get across in, in that letter um, because of the situation that I was in. I think it's easy, not necessarily easy, but a lot of the a lot of times what we hear in the media are people that have come from um, um, communities of color where, you know, majority of that community um, is black or majority of that community is a minority. But I, I wanted to speak up from the position that, hey, Derby is 91 percent white and that is a community that I'm from. And that's who I am because I was raised in that community and, and I'll never disown that. But also this piece of me, which is the color of my skin and my culture that is tied to that, I wanna make sure that you all are aware that that's also important to me. And that is a part of your community because you're saying I'm a part of your community. So it was amazing actually to, to see the, the reaction and um, really just open up the conversation and, and talk to people after that, because at the end of the day, that's really what it's about. It's about open communication, being transparent, being honest and seeing how we can all get through this together. I love the, the four sentences, short sentences, you know, my character, you know, my values, you know, my smile, which by the way, I've learned that already big smile. <laughs> and you know, Devin, I always say mm -hmm. a smile and you can't fake these things. You shouldn't fake these things. Yeah. A smile goes a long ways. It's a universal right. language, and it's it's something that I've I've learned in baseball. How, how come sometimes players fall in love with, or fans fall in love with certain players that sometimes they can't even understand the accent, or they even speak a different right, language? Yeah. <laughs> you know, often Spanish, sometimes Japanese. I say, a smile goes a long exactly, ways. Yeah. And so that's obviously something that they watched you grow up with. You didn't start smiling at 20, 25 exactly, years old. Yeah. That's who you are. What a, a couple questions. One, you, you you mentioned the numbers in terms of percentages. Just curious, your graduating class in Derby was how many kids approximately? About four hundred, I believe. Okay, so you know, big, big, big class. How many how many black kids in the class? Oof, I That's could probably go back and count on a hand if I needed to. Mm -hmm. um, we were probably at about. I, I would say about 20-ish, maybe okay. below 20. Okay. I bring that up because, I, and I think I've seen you write, and I've heard from you know, so many friends in discussions that I'd never had in my life before and should have, but that part of the white privilege is walking into a room and not thinking about looking like everyone else, right. not having to be different. I experienced, the only way that I could relate to it is my brother was working in the Peace Corps for two years, and I went over mm -hmm. and visited him in West Africa. One, one of just the most beautiful experiences of my life. But, you know, everywhere we walked, we were the only two white people. So you always had eyes on you. Right. And right. so my, my question with that, and saying that not in any way understanding what someone growing up 
experiences uh, as a, a black boy, a black girl, and then as an adult, as a man or a woman, but the extra effort that it takes to have to just think about that every single moment. Maybe once you get into that fo football locker room, it's, it's quite a bit different because you have that, that mix of people and that diversity. Right, right. Were you aware of that growing up? What Was it a thing for you? You know, I did not become, I experienced it, but I did not become aware of it until later on in my life. And I think it's because that's, that's all I knew. Like, I didn't really realize that I was going through that until I was a little bit older and became a little bit more conscious. Because when you're young, it's, you know, you're little kids and you're running around on the playground. Um, and, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the, the term, you don't see color. But really, if, if there's any point in life where people don't see color, it's when they're, they're little kids, right? Yeah. You're, my, 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 the best friend that I've had the longest time, which is Sean Smith, I met, we met in the first grade, I think, when I, I first got to Derby. He's white, I'm black, and we call each other brothers from another mother. And we are, we're thick as blood. It's like that is my, my brother. And so... It was it was tough for me to be able to see that, but by the time I got to, I, I actually I could tell you the pivotal point for me was around middle school, when I we started to get more and more involved in in my church, which is predominantly black, and I spent a lot of time with them during the summertime, and I realized, oh, there is a stark difference between my culture and the culture that I am around every single day. And then when I went back to uh, middle school, the, the following school year, it was just that that transparent for me. Um, and it was difficult to to have to go through that. And, and it's it's not that it's like one specific instance, but it's that compound effect. Right. It's every single day you you feel mm -hmm. slightly and slightly and slightly out of place. And the concept of compound interest, all of that, that just adds up. And that's why you hear the term or the phrase, you know, black people are just so exhausted when, yep. when we saw those videos come out. That's what we mean when we say we're so exhausted, it's so tiring. You know, things like that happen all of the time. Black mm -hmm. people are put in positions where we're uncomfortable and we're outside of, or we're in the, the minority all the time, or we're the only person of color in the room, only black person of color or black person in the room all the time. And that one instance isn't necessarily traumatizing but add the years, the decades onto your life of every single day living that, and that's where it gets pretty tough. I've, that's what I've come to understand in the last three months, more than anything. That, it, that, that sounds like a smaller thing in the grand scheme of when you start talking about brutality and, and, and all the different elements that we've seen lately in terms of racism and even just some of the absolute garbage and free license of people to say whatever they want behind right. it fake Twitter handle and all that crap, but I've come to understand that subtle end of we're tired means day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. So that, that to me has been the biggest revelation and one that I wish I had understood earlier, but one that I want to continue to, to just help explain to my white friends that say, well, no, I mean, I've got black friends and I understand I'm not racist. And you know what I learned from a Pastor, Pastor 83, who I had recently on here, um, very dynamic pastor here in Kansas City, was that, that you can, there can be racism without racists mm. and, the, and the systemic racism that is involved. One more question about that, and then I want to ask you some baseball-themed questions to a football yeah. to a football guy or former football guy, maybe once football, always football. But percentage-wise, just ask me, what, what were the responses from that letter that you wrote to Derby? What percentage positive, or was there anything negative coming back? Oh, by far, um, overwhelmingly positive. I, I would put it in a honestly 99th percentile positive. I'm not sure that I got much negative feedback on that one, to be honest. I know it's out there, but it probably sure. just, it didn't get back to me. So overwhelmingly positive feedback. Yeah, and I, I was just curious. I mean, that, yeah. that doesn't mean that that the bad stuff isn't existing. Exactly. Yeah, they'll 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 find ways to take shots in a form right. that's different that's unfortunately where we're at right now and you know i i think we need to keep exposing people like that even if they're hiding i've got right. three baseball themed questions i want to ask you professionally speaking at this point think about exxon Mobil, think about stanford this might be the answer it could be stanford i don't know 
what's the biggest home run you have hit here now in your career? Oh, I'm I'm gonna say Stanford, but I the reason I say Stanford is because I'm always gonna say my biggest home run is the most recent home run. Mm. I mean, for me, I if I am following what I value, which is I never want to be complacent, I always want to continue to stretch myself. I would hope that every single thing that I continue to to build upon and try to achieve is that next biggest thing. And it does is not necessarily tied to money or status or power or anything. It's just if I identify if I identify something and I say this is worth pursuing, I would hope that that's the next big run. And uh, I would say Stanford's a, the next uh, home run. It puts me in a position where I can truly decide or or truly have a little bit more access to being able to to change the world on my terms. I love that. The flip side of that is biggest swing and miss. What's a swing and miss you've had and what did you learn from it? Ooh, I have a lot of <laughs> I have a lot of swing and misses. Um let's see. I would say uh, I laugh. A lot of people are, that that go through the NBA application are, are going to laugh at this. I was I would say the biggest swing and miss for me is trying to study for the GMAT, which is the test that's required to get into business school and it's a very um infamous test i would say it's grueling it's it's really tough to take and i think in some ways it is a um it's one of those weed out mechanisms that really try to see who's gonna uh, be able to persevere through and the first time i took it was absolutely horrendous the second time was a little bit better but it took me about close to a year a year and a half to to be able to get to the point where i had a, a decently good score to to get into school so that those were probably the biggest swing and misses because there's so many times where i wanted to give up and i want to make it clear that that you know anybody who's in a position of a success feels that way they they get to a point where they think i can't do this i want to give up but you know for some reason people that are successful just figure out how to continue to push on and, and persevere so that those were huge swings and huge utter misses for me that's the humility question to me is what that is because uh, those of us that are humble can find all of those moments and and they resonate the last baseball theme question is my culture question essentially small ball what are the little things baseball terms bunts sacrifices stolen bases that add up to the home runs what what are you can understand this as a football player too not that everything needs to be in football terms it's not all about that that pick six or that yeah. interception there's so many little things in your world today what are the little things that add up to the big things i love this question um i wish i had uh i'm look i'm looking around for my um there so the reason i'm looking around is because i actually and it, it's on my website i there's there's a little mechanism that I created. It's called the feel good matrix, um, and this matrix is matrix is basically something that I before I moved out of my place I had it posted up right right above my desk. It's I think it's on my phone. I could pull it up, but the feel good matrix is uh, split up into six quadrants. It's just six different squares, and it's very simple, easy reminders for me of what I need to do day in and day out to, mm -hmm. to take care of business. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm trying to remember off the top, I think. And I also have um, them prioritized. So here's the most important that you need to focus on. If you're not feeling your 100% self, let's start here, then go all the way down to number six. And so for example, number one is sleep, right? If you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not getting the adequate amount of sleep, and it doesn't mean I need to get eight hours every single day, but on average, are you getting enough sleep to function the right way? And then the next one, I, I believe is, um, um, I believe the next one is exercise, right? So are you moving enough? Are you keeping your body active? And it doesn't mean I need to be in there trying to hit a new personal record every time in the gym, but are you, if you don't have time to get a full workout in, are you getting a 30 minute walk, walk per day? Are you, if you're stuck in the office, are you standing up and sitting down? Are you taking walks upstairs and downstairs and keeping your blood flowing? Uh, the next one, for example, would be meditation and, and mindfulness. Are you finding quiet time to sit down, whether it's five, 10 minutes a day, right? 
And so it, the list continues. I think it's like water consumption. Are you drinking enough water? Caffeine and alcohol consumption. Uh, you know, are you drinking too much caffeine, too much alcohol? Um, make sure to take care of that. And then healthy eating. Are you eating the right things? So those six things I would say are the the small the small ball for me. It's are you taking care of business? Are you doing the right things day in and day out? And going back again, it's about sustainability and consistency. I can't hit all those six on Monday and then um, neglect them the next six days of the week and be like, oh man, well, I don't know. I'm not at my peak performance. It's every single day, day in, day out. Are you hitting these very small things because they're going to add up to greatness at the end of the day? All right. Fascinating stuff. Four final quick rapid fire questions here as we wind it down in the last few minutes. My, my, my rounding the bases questions. The first one you talked about getting up at four 30 in the morning. So what, what would a typical bedtime be for Devin? Hedgepeth? Oof, probably nine 30. Wow. <laughs> Old man. <laughs> I need, I need work to do, but I'm still working at that time of night. At least when baseball is going on. Okay. Yeah. To bed at nine 30 up at four 30. And Devin's still in his 20s, I believe, right? You're still in your 20s. Yeah, 20, 28. Man, 28 going on 65. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the, 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 it's very impressive habits. Back to your football days. Fastest 40 time you had? Four, four, four. Four, four, four. Wow. Yeah. What could you do today? Oof. I'd, I'd be lucky to break four, eight, probably. <laughs> that's not an old man thing that's being out of the game for a little bit don't yeah. test that one we don't need any more achilles injuries <laughs> third question as we round the bases who was your favorite player whether it be growing up or watching at oklahoma state or even at this point did you have a a, a cornerback or any type of player that you wanted to model yourself after i'm i'm gonna take the not the cheap route here, but give a slightly different answer. My favorite player was Dion Amade. Dion is my best friend that I made while I was at Oklahoma State. He was a safety. He actually changed his number after I had my career ending injury. So he, he switched from 28 to number 18 in my mm -hmm. honor. Um, and Dion and I, the reason I say that, not I know these are rapid fires, but when you're an athlete and you're playing and you get injured, you can't play anymore. It's actually a very cathartic experience to watch your teammates, people you know, still on the grind and playing every day um, on the field. And Dion, Dion and I are, are like brothers. It's another one of my best friends. And he and I still have a very close relationship. So I, I just had a jolt of energy every time I watched him playing out there. I love watching him play. I love that. I thought you were going to go with a different Dion, a uh, more famous Dion <laughs> in terms of, of primetime yeah. Dion Sanders. But but that's a great personal answer. Final question, my walk-off question for you. When Stanford Business School ends and you, you, you move on with your career, where do you want to see yourself in, in 10 years? Or as you're approaching, say, 40 years old and you're still going to bed at 930 at night, where, where do you want to be? I, I want to be able to uphold the Stanford GSB model, and that's change lives, change organizations, change the world. There's not one specific career or job that I think about for me in the future. Um, you know, I could do anything, any industry, but at the end of the day, I truly want to be able to drive impact across a broad organization. I want to be able to change lives. I want to be able to sit down one-on-one -on -one with someone and have a conversation and talk to them in January and come back in December and see how not only have they gotten better from a professional standpoint, but they're actually just better people because of the the conversations that we've had. So that would be my where where I want to be. And I know it's more of a, a soft answer, but I I just really want to be able to affect people's lives in a positive way. I actually think it's a great answer, and and it's a phenomenal way to to end the podcast. If if people want to learn more about Devin, certainly you could you could check out his his LinkedIn and all the social media. But here it is, Achilles healed. There's that number 18 that Devin wore at Oklahoma State. AchillesHealed18.com. Going great places in life. I, and I love that. I, who knows where it's going to be. But I know that you're going to make an impact. You already are. You'll continue to. So, Devin, it's been in the works for you and I for a <laughs> while. I'm glad we finally got a chance to catch up. Best of luck at Stanford. I can't wait to see all the updates. And thanks for spending time. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
All right, that is Devin Hedgepeth, and uh, what a, an awesome conversation, one that I think could have gone on and on with all the different aspects of Devin's life. Appreciate everybody watching Rounding the Bases Live, presented by Enterprise Bank and Trust. A big thanks to Enterprise, hashtag no stopping you. Hope to catch you tomorrow. I'm Joel Goldberg on Rounding the Bases Live.